We're here in the Clean Laboratory in the Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas at Austin. The analysis that we're doing here, this process is called ion exchange chemistry. What we're doing is we're separating certain elements from other elements so that we can prepare it for analysis in an instrument called the mass spectrometer. When we do this analysis, we're measuring different concentrations of different isotopes in the decay chain that starts with uranium-238 as the parent. By measuring the different amounts of these things, in this case, in a particular growth layer from a cave calcite deposit or a speleothem, we're able to determine a very precise and accurate age for that layer within that cave deposit. We're using these kinds of analyses to test the hypothesis that when we were undergoing ice ages here in Texas and the ice started to retreat, it changed the climate dynamics in this part of the world here in Texas. These analyses are from speleothems from a cave, a cave in Texas. We'll be testing the hypothesis that rainfall patterns were very different, wherein we had a retreating ice sheet, meltwaters coming down into the Gulf of Mexico, and that was changing the distribution and patterns by which moisture came from the Gulf of Mexico and other sources to this part of the world. We hope to be able to use this to better understand the dynamics of climate in Texas so that perhaps we can also project forward into the future and be informed about how changing periodicity of climatic events like droughts may occur in the future. Well, that's a little bit about the kinds of research that go on in this clean laboratory here at the University of Texas. What we'd really like to chat about today is the scientific method in general. And so, when we talk about science, we really need to think about it as distinct from non-science, much of which is actually nonsense. It's the only way to rationally predict future events. If we're going to understand when we're going to run out of groundwater for drinking in certain parts of the world that are water stressed, we need the scientific method. If we're going to ask the question, what happens to the environment when we burn fossil fuels? If we're going to pose the prediction when we should evacuate a Gulf Coast city when it's being a hurricane is bearing down on it. If we're going to pose the, the query, how can I best avoid getting Ebola, HIV, West Nile virus, or cancer? To really address these kinds of questions, which are fundamentally scientific questions about scientific processes, we need the scientific method. We need the rigors of the scientific method. We cannot simply rely upon intuition or a really good looking website to give us this kind of information. We're gonna first ask the question, what is science? And the key to asking the question, what is science and the scientific method, is being able to understand the difference between observations and inferences. So a really good example of all of this, if we go back to our iconic diagram of global change, that is the rising CO2 levels in the Earth's atmosphere over the past thousand years, if we look at that diagram, that rise of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere is a really good case example of how to understand the difference between observations and inferences. So an observation may be that the level of carbon dioxide, its concentration in the atmosphere, has increased over the past century. And we could see that from the data from 1900 to 2000. Another observation is that the temperature of the Earth's atmosphere has, in, has increased over the past century. Those data are not shown here, but that's another observation we can make based on recorded observations from instruments, such as thermometers. Okay, so an observation is different from an inference in that an inference is really the, a synonym for a hypothesis, in that a hypothesis we can define as a tentative inference built on observations made to test our original inference. So we might observe something, we might think because of that observation we might infer something else. That becomes our hypothesis and we'll now seek to come up with new observations that will test that hypothesis. So examples related to this curve, the CO2 curve of inferences or hypotheses will be that carbon dioxide will continue to increase in the Earth's atmosphere over the next several decades. Okay, that is an inference. We don't have that as an observation, and that is testable by making observations into the future. Another inference we might make from the temperature record, again not shown here, is that Earth's atmosphere will continue to warm over the next several decades. Again, 
an inference or a hypothesis readily testable by making the temperature measurements into the future. So while we might define an, an, a hypothesis quite accurately as a tentative inference built on observations made to test the inference, a theory takes it a step further. It's a little bit more solidified. A theory is a plausible or scientifically acceptable general principle offered to explain phenomena. Okay, So that takes a hypothesis that's been tested over and over again and advances it if it holds up over the time. If the hypothesis continues to be upheld over further observations, we might advance it and call it a theory. So an example of that is the theory of plate tectonics. And several lectures from now, we'll actually get into the theory of plate tectonics and how it was built, how it started out with a hypothesis. OK, if something, if a theory is around long enough and again gets tested time and again in all kinds of different settings, maybe even all kinds of different planets, we might then advance it to become a scientific law. So a law, scientific law, is a statement of order and relation of phenomena that are found to be invariable under the same conditions. So in other words, we know about the law of gravity. That's a great example. Time and again, wherever we might go test this, that's a lock solid theory that we advance to a law because it is so repeatable under so many different conditions. Another fundamental aspect of the scientific method is this concept of peer review. So peer review really involves how scientists address and hopefully advance knowledge by publishing their findings in peer-reviewed publications that are widely disseminated, circulated, and criticized. So let's take a moment to think about the peer review process and what's involved. So I just described to you a hypothesis being tested in this laboratory that the patterns of rainfall in Texas were different in the past when we had glaciers receding compared to what we see today in the 21st century. Now this hypothesis might be testable by collecting some observations in these cave deposits, in caves, in the modern drip waters in caves to see how they respond to changes in climate today. And we might use that to test the hypothesis in the past. This in fact is the hypothesis that's being tested as part of the master's thesis research of one of your TAs. Let's call her Michelle. So let's walk through an example of what Michelle is going to go through in testing that hypothesis. So she's developing this hypothesis through the past experimentation in our research group. She's come along and said, you know what, we can test this by looking at these modern drip waters here in Texas from these caves. She'll go through and conduct a series of analyses, collect a whole bunch of data, go out to caves, into the field, collect samples, bring them back to the lab, analyze them chemically, compare those chemical results and the composition of those drip waters over time with how Texas's climate has changed over that same period of time. She may discover some new knowledge, some correspondence between climate change and the chemistry of the drip waters in the cave. She'll go, aha, I've got an important link. I've got an important test to this hypothesis. I think this hypothesis is holding up that in fact we have a way to test how climate has changed using drip water chemistry from cave deposits. What Michelle will then do is present her discovery. She'll present it within our research group, which is around 10 people of undergraduate students, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, professors. She'll present it to us and she'll invite feedback. She'll invite criticism will be a relatively small group in a small room. We're all familiar with each other. We all feel comfortable giving each other feedback. And then she'll come up with new ideas, new ways, new observations to make to further test that hypothesis. Well, then she'll take it and advance it further and present it in a department seminar. That might be in front of 30 people, perhaps 100 people, depending on the size of the room and how much interest there is. And then again, she'll invite questions, comments, criticisms from this larger audience of geoscientists. Finally, finally, she will then make a presentation at a national conference or an international conference, such as the American Geophysical Union meeting this fall in San Francisco, California. There may be tens of thousands of people attending this. They all won't be going to her presentation, but a large number of them 
will. And these are experts in the field from the United States, from Europe, from all over the world come to this international conference. And again, she will be inviting comment, criticism, etc. Basically, she's in the mode of give me your best shot because I'm about to go publish this, put this into the literature where it will be forever and subject to criticism. So then she'll write a manuscript up for publication. It'll be submitted to a journal, what we call a peer-reviewed scientific journal, ultimately appearing as an article in that journal. There'll be multiple referees, editors, who will pass judgment and really try to criticize and tear apart the logic arguments, how good are the data, how good are the inferences based on the data, etc. The decision will come back from the editor who's handling this manuscript, taking all of the referees' arguments and criticisms into account, and there may be three choices. One is accept, accept this manuscript as is, revise the manuscript, make considerable revisions, and then come back and we'll look at it again, or it may be outright rejected, saying, you know what, the science here is just not up to scratch. This is not good enough for this peer-reviewed journal. Thank you anyway for submitting. We wish you luck in the future. So hopefully you're somewhere in between. It's almost never get a response back from an editor that says, yep, this is good, except there's always something, always something they find. This is called the peer review process. Peer is in quotes, because sometimes you think these people who criticize your work, how could they possibly be beyond peers? They're being really mean. But if done correctly, which is, is the vast majority of the time, the reviewers are not being mean, they're doing their job. It's their obligation. They're the, they're the vanguard, they're the gatekeepers through which you have to get in order for this science to be published in the literature where it will stay embedded in the literature and subject to scrutiny years after it's first published. You could come along 20 years later and say, you know what, we found an error here. We found an incorrect way of thinking. Here it is. Here's an advancement. And in the scientific method, you would welcome those advancements. You would like to see your work be improved upon by those further down the road. So that's a short tale of what Michelle will have to go through in order to get her results into the peer-reviewed scientific literature. So when we consider the scientific method, we also need to consider how the scientific method may go awry. So we could call things approaches to problems scientific. We could also call them non-scientific. So you have science and you have non-science. Now science is distinct from non-science and from nonsense because scientific conclusions have the following characteristics. Fol scientific conclusions are always tentative. Few conclusions remain unmodified as we go forward and as new knowledge is developed. Scientific conclusions are also testable and falsifiable by experiment. They're continually modified and they're even replaced by new and better conclusions. Scientific conclusions are also documented extensively, including the methods that are used. Scientific methods are subject, and scientific conclusions are subject to the scrutiny of peer review. And scientific conclusions are widely disseminated. They're subject to criticism forever. Once a study gets embedded into the literature, it can be criticized and improved upon at any time. And in fact, you hope as a researcher, as a scientist, that that's what happens. The last thing you want is to put all this effort into a scientific study, publish it, and no one says anything about it. You would hope that it would attract a lot of attention, not necessarily thousands of people saying, hey, you know what, you're wrong, but a number of people saying, wow, this is actually inspiring me to think of new ways of testing this hypothesis to create new knowledge. That is what keeps science moving forward, constantly trying to test the existing hypotheses. It's important in relying on science to understand how science sometimes goes awry, gets off, gets off the rails, so to speak. So to talk about the different kinds of non-science or nonsense, we group them all together in this, using this term called voodoo science. So voodoo science refers to the three, three different kinds of non-science. So one is called pathological science, the other is called pseudoscience, and the third is called junk science. Pathological science involves people who are doing science but get so invested in an outcome, so emotionally tied up 
in seeing a hypothesis proven or disproven that they don't take the care to check their results and they get basically carried away, pathologically carried away and they get led down the primrose path to coming up with incorrect results. Second kind of voodoo science is called pseudoscience and this involves people who are, think they're doing science but they're not actually doing science. And again, they're not following the scientific method correctly because they're not going through, for example, peer review. They're just coming up with some experiments. They're not verifying them. They're not reproducing them. They're not subjecting their results to criticism. But they're putting, putting important claims out there. That's pseudoscience. And lastly, there's junk science, where people purportedly have science behind claims in an effort to fool people, fool the public, fool judges, fool the law, etc. Why would anyone want to try to fool the public? So there's three kinds of voodoo science, pathological, pseudoscience, and junk science. Can you think of an example of each one of those? And we'll come back to that in class. See you later. <laughs>